Hi, and welcome back to another video. Uh, we are here at Intel in Hillsboro, Oregon, US. I'm joined by Mark Galina, and uh, we actually just had a, a good chat of about one hour, and then I decided that we definitely have to record some part of this because <laughs> very, very interesting. Maybe you can just introduce yourself, like what are you doing at Intel? Maybe tell sure. a bit about your background. Yeah, so Mark Galina, I'm a senior thermal analyst here at Intel, or thermal architect. Um, so I will focus, uh, my job primarily is looking at uh, how does heat move out of our CPU and into the rest of the system. Uh, so looking at things like heatsink design, airflow um, through the chassis of a system. I keep waving at a laptop that I think is off camera. So it's <laughs> right there just so people know what I'm pointing yeah. at. Um, and, so, and also going all the way down into the SOC architecture itself in terms of how is our heat managed within the uh, cores, within the rest of the SOC. Um, our thermal management policies and controls and things like that. Yeah, we just had an interesting discussion about um, dye thinning. So yeah. um, to the community, especially if you think back to when 9900K was launched and um, Intel went back to solder Tim, we also did in our launch review an, an analysis of how much does it help to manually grind down the dye, like manually thin the dye. We figured out if we went from like 0.8 millimeter to 0.6 millimeter, it definitely helps to improve thermals. So I was like, why is it, uh, or back then in the video, we asked ourselves the question, why was it like only 0.8 and not 0.6? And then maybe you can explain a bit about uh, the whole dye thinning Thing, like sure yeah <laughs> yeah so where do you want to start do you want to start at the physics in terms of why is dye thinning better or yeah may maybe wanna... let's go from there maybe okay so yeah. let's go from there so I think we sketch it out but I'll do it again um, just for so I'm gonna draw big does it pick up okay so we've got the substrate um, which is the PCB that has all the, the routing on it uh, and then I'm gonna put our silicon dye sitting on top of that I'm gonna draw it thick because we're gonna draw some pictures in there in a minute uh, we've got die attach, so this is a very small ball grid array. It's not quite a BGA, but it attaches to the substrate. And then with our desktop parts, uh, we've got the thermal interface material sitting here. All right, this was, had been the polymer tim, then the solder tim, and then we've got our IHS sitting on top of that. Finally, we've got another layer of thermal interface material. And then at the very top, uh, we have our desktop thermal solution. This video is powered by Seasonic and the new Vertex GX. This ATX 3.0 PSU is rated for 1200 watt and natively supports the new 12 volt high power connector and thus is PCI Express Gen 5 compatible. This is ideal to pair the Vertex GX with the latest RTX 40 Gen, but the three included 8 pin PCIe connectors also allow to use it for example with RX 7000 GPUs by AMD. And the Vertex offers all necessary protection features such as OPP, OVP and OCP. The high efficiency of about 90% at 50% load allows a cold and at the same time very silent operation due to the semi-passive fan. Find out more in the link below. So that would be the, right. the heatsink. The heatsink. Yeah. Right? Okay, so now just to orient everybody, the transistors where all of the heat is being generated is on this surface of the die. Um, and so what happens, and I drew it showing across the entire surface of the die, right? But really, if you look at our die, it has distinct cores that generate different amounts of heat compared to the other areas in the, in the die, right? So really what I'm gonna do for this discussion is I'm gonna make this area be a lot smaller, right? So let's say we've got our core sitting in just this portion of the die. Um, now, when the heat is generated, right, when you're running the CPU, uh, the heat needs to conduct up to the top surface of the die through that first level of thermal interface material into the IHS, through the second thermal interface material, and then into the heat sink. Um, so heat transfer is always just driven by our temperature delta, right? So we've got our, our junction temperature here, and then there's gonna be another temperature there and continue onward, right? So we always go from hot temperature to cold temperature, um, and heat likes to go everywhere. So there's gradients all over the place. Um, so what happens is we've got lower temperatures as you go across the die. So he, the heat's gonna go in these directions as well. And so it, like a heat transfer to X and Y? Yeah, um, right. it, it goes in three dimensions, yeah. right? And so 
this is conduction. This is pretty straightforward, right? So when I was mentioning the, the temperature gradient that drives the heat transfer, um, there's a few parameters that come into play, right? One is the length. So how far does this go? Right, I'll, I'll draw it here for the length. Then the area, meaning how much or what area is the heat transferring through. And then finally, the thermal conductivity of the material. So I'm going to write it in terms of the thermal resistance as a function of L over K. Right. K is our thermal conductivity. So when we talk about thermal conductivity, that's how readily or, or can heat or can a material transfer heat, right? And so if we look at our silicon, um, this is about I was saying 190 watts per meter Kelvin. Our copper, even though this is looks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> looks like aluminum. It looks like not. aluminum. It's actually nickel. <laughs> so, so what we do is copper is what the actual heat sink is. So if you scratch through that layer, you'll find shiny copper underneath. We put nickel on it so it doesn't oxidize, right? Makes so sense, if, yeah. So if you touch it, right, if you touch a shiny copper penny or something like that, it oxidizes pretty quickly. Uh, we don't want these to oxidize, so we put nickel on them. It's not aluminum. Um, so copper has is 390 uh, watts per meter Kelvin. And then our, our thermal interface materials are much, much lower than that, right? So um, earlier we were talking about if we put liquid metal on here, uh, it would be about 36 watts per meter Kelvin. Now, the nice thing about the thermal interface materials is these are really, really thin. Um, yeah. But you still have not only the material conductivity itself, but the contact interface resistance between them, right? Um, so what we try to do is we try to balance what, how long is this conduction length um, from this point to these points up here, right? So we're trying to balance the heat or the temperature gradient across the whole thing. So depending on the size of the core, and if we really want to get into it, the areas within the core that are generating the most heat, uh, we're trying to balance what is the thickness of this um, die relative to the thermal interface resistance or the conductivity between this first layer of thermal interface material and the IHS, as well as that second layer, right? And so, when we started looking at it, there is an optimum based on the size of the core and the lithography node that we're on. Um, and trying to move this die thickness down, right? So as we go thinner and thinner, we start uh, improving or reducing the thermal interface resistance uh, just to the top surface, right? But if you go too thin, then the conduction pads out like the, here, the heat spreading within the silicon will itself be... gets constricted, yeah, right? Um, so there's that sweet spot. Um, if I remember right, it's been a while since I've ran that, but it was somewhere around 200 to 300 microns is where the trade-off was, where below about 200, we started seeing an increase in resistance for the, for the particular design I was doing some evaluations on. Um, and you're, you're probably going to ask next, well, why aren't you down there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like uh, current CPUs, uh, current Intel are at about uh, 600 um, micrometers. So 0 0.6 millimeters, um, AMD is on 0 0.8 right now um, for the desktop CPUs. And previously, like on, on Ivy Bridge, we saw 0 0.4. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the reason why are, are there's more than just the thermals that come into play. Um, and that is it takes a bit in order to build all of these. And so we have to balance off what is our manufacturing equipment capability, how, can, how fast can we bring those tools online. Um, not only that, but as you handle these different die thicknesses through all parts of the manufacturing process. You don't want to break the die because that's costly, right? Yeah, you yeah, just have yeah. to throw it away. So we're balancing more constraints than just thermals when we're figuring out what is the optimum thickness, right? It's, there's a lot of other parameters that come into play. Yeah, you said that, the, I mean, the, the thinning happens after everything is already done. So the, the yeah. entire wafer is pretty much ready to go. Yeah. And uh, so it's the last step, and it's also... Yeah, it's one of the there. last steps. So if you mess it up, like, you've just scrapped a lot of work <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that yeah. was done uh, before, before the, the die is ready to ship. And so. if we think about how many trips you make per day, it's also adding to the manufacturing duration of the entire part. Yeah, so just, just, just in terms of volume, right? You yeah. have to, not only do you want to make sure that you can do this well, but you need to do this well many, many, many times a day. Um, and we were trying to figure out how many die we ship a day. And <laughs> like, it's, it's not a number that I could find readily external. And uh, we were trying to come up with it. The numbers are big. I'll let you figure it yeah, out. Yeah, <laughs> several hundred thousand pieces a day. So uh, I mean, we did, we did a rough estimation of the entire revenue of Intel and then the, maybe the average uh, CPU price. Yeah. And then you can make an estimate of how many 
CPUs they're making per day, which is completely mind blowing. And then obviously I can understand that, um, yeah, just the time it adds and also the, the capability um, like of manufacturing. You said you might have to like like create a separate building just for this process. That yeah, were... yeah. <laughs> so just in terms of the number of units uh, and, and the volume of material that we would need to source. So. And so for, uh, for 9900K, going back to that uh, CPU, um, you, you said that um, um, there was like a trade-off because it was the first CPU that went back to, to solar tim. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't do the, the diet thinning at a, the same time. Yeah, I, like it's been a few years, so I'm trying to remember all the right details. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's just be clear on that. Um, but doing too many changes at once starts adding additional risk, right? And so this is one of the things that we were talking about earlier as well in terms of like Intel, um, we're very, very serious about our reliability and the quality of our parts. And so we'll, when we make changes, we want to make sure that it lasts for the entire life of the part. Uh, which means there's a huge amount of data collection that's done um, before we ever launch the part, right? So some changes that we already have data collection and characterization already done, like those we can usually do faster, um, but then lots of changes simultaneously require more data collection. And when you're looking at, okay, the part needs to launch on this date, right, in order to meet all of the, the commercial things that we need, right? Like if you don't have time to collect all of that reliability data, then sometimes you'll push it out to the next uh, generation uh, as well. So, and it, it will also depend on the exact CPU what the optimum of the die thickness is, right? So, we yeah, can, for sure. So you have Go to reevaluate this every single time. Yeah. Because so if we change the area of the core or change some of the features within the core itself, yeah. that would shift things. Now, like. If you say, okay, and if you go from, uh, say, a ninth generation to a tenth generation or tenth to eleventh generation, would you see a huge difference? Probably not. Um, but over the years and over the generations, like probably if you skip two or three process nodes, then you'd notice that, yeah, that optimum has changed quite a bit just due to the underlying lithography and the features that go into the core. Um, one more thing um, I was personally also wondering about um, was the um, the risk that might be involved with uh, using solder tim over polymer tim because you, I mean, you basically form a solid connection between the mm -hmm. IHS and the, and, the, and the chip. And then th there were articles that were referring to cracks inside the material right. over, over time. And so, yeah, so that is one of the failure areas that we study a lot. Um, that's outside of my area of expertise for sure. Like, as, as I mentioned earlier, like we've got teams of material scientists that are working on that. Um, so it's a, it's a huge challenge to do both in volume and then for full reliability. And like you were telling me about your experiments that you'd done where you could do it successfully and it lasts for a Couple brief of amount cycles, of time, yeah. right? Yeah. And we're aiming for multiple years worth of work or of, of operation for the CPU with lots and lots and lots of cycles. So um, making changes to this material stack uh, usually is, a few years worth of development in R and D ahead of time. Yeah, um, because um, that, that's what I was wondering about. So, if you make a CPU like the ninety nine hundred K with solar tim, and you're looking maybe like five years into the future after thousands or ten thousands of temperature cycles, you would have to simulate that, right? So, you would have to. Uh, yeah, not only simulate. Well, so simulations only get you so far. Yeah, but right? what 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 about the real time, right? Like, yeah. uh, it's it's a bit different. So so there's that's part of where the data collection comes into play, and why I said it takes so long. So if you go read up on Arrhenius and Arrhenius modeling, there's a whole practice or a whole science around accelerating failure modes, mm -hmm. and the ways you do that is, I mean, it's not just if if I'm going to break this pen and I just bend it ten million times, right? Like, it's not quite that. With Arrhenius, you raise your temperature, right? So you, you increase your temperature and that accelerates the, some of the activation or brings the activation energy higher, um, which accelerates some of your failure modes. So the, the, not the game, but the strategy is to pick a right set of experiments where, yeah, I still need to go through tens of thousands of cycles, but I pick the parameters in that experiment in terms of what temperature do I run things at and what are the exact start, beginning and end points for that in order to say, okay, I don't want to have to sit here and wait five years before I can say if this part's going to be good or not, right? Yeah. I want to do that data collection in a manageable time frame, yeah. which still even like on a calendar basis is a lengthy investment for us. 
Um, but we do that in order to make sure that, yeah, when we launch the part and we say the warranty is three years or five years, that, yeah, we're very confident that it's going to last that long and you're going to get the full yeah, I mean, out of the part. From experience, we know that if, if you say it lasts five years, then it's in reality it's like 25 minutes. <laughs> it's, it's pretty hard to, to beat the parts up compared to what we Yeah, because, you know, when, whenever CPUs are launched and we're thinking about parameters we're setting for overclocking, for example, um, and then people are always afraid, yeah, maybe this voltage is too high or like this temperature is too high or whatever. But like retrospectively, if we look at CPUs that are like 15 years old, they are still running fine these days. So it seems to be very, very difficult. Well, to, yeah, so yeah. You, I mean, you have to be careful there because yeah. the, accel the um, failure modes do get accelerated by both voltage and temperature. Yeah, absolutely. Right, and but, it's not linear. But, but even then, yes. even, even then it seems to be that they can take much more than what people usually think. For, yeah. I would say, the yeah. average part, for sure. Yeah. Um, and in fact, yeah, it's, uh, when I, the comments that I read online, everybody starts freaking out if they see a CPU above 90 degrees C. <laughs> I mean, really, yeah. like, if you don't know this, uh, go look at our specs. 100 is usually right around where our actual spec is, and we've got safeguards in place that prevent the part from so, going So, I mean, it. technically, that but, would mean if you, if you run your CPU for three years on, on, like, exactly that temperature, that's the spec, right? Not quite. Um, so... Like, I guess if you ca had your CPU operating some workload nonstop, let's say you loop Cinebench yeah. right, for three years, I yeah. honestly don't know what would happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we want to be you, careful you about that. To, uh, you would have a good uh, energy bill, yeah? <laughs> yeah, you totally would. I actually think you'd probably be fine because there's more than just the temperature and the voltage, right? There's also the power cycles and temperature cycles themselves. So heating everything up and cooling it down, um, as things heat up, right, you've got the coefficient of thermal expansion. Everything moves and, and, and yeah. contracts, right? So that's part of what's causing the breakdown in the thermal interface material yes. that you were referring to earlier. But other things start happening as well, right? So the question is, like, if you kept everything up at temperature, voltage, and frequency nonstop for those three years, it's yeah, that's stressful from the voltage, frequency, and Yeah, and but current it's comp compensating the temperature cycle. But you don't have the temperature cycle. So that's why, like, ah, okay. like I... Do, I Honestly, I can't tell you which right. would win out, right? Yes, yeah, so from a speculation yeah. perspective, I actually think it'd probably be fine. Um, but again, like I've never sat there with a CPU for three years <laughs> to find out. So yeah. Um, um, so about the the, the solar trim, uh, solar trim, um, from at least from what I measured after opening a CPU. So it's a bit difficult to measure sometimes, but it's, it seemed to be like 0 0.3 millimeters thick, roughly, maybe 0 0.4. That um, seems pretty thick. That was my question, because it seems like overall it always seems really thick. Like, especially after the lidding, like the residues we can measure was always in, 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 that, in that region. So I'm trying to remember, because it's been a while since I've looked at our drawings for those. 300 to 400 microns is, I think, too thick. Um, I, I would have expected thinner. How are you, like when you delitted, how yeah. are you doing? You were just measuring like the flakes or trying to measure the thickness of the flakes? Um, it depend on some CPUs, um, after delitting, um, some parts of the solar team came off very, uh, like didn't leave residues on the chip. So it was um, still a very good condition on the IHS. So we just okay. measured from this to the IHS height. Uh, so I don't because, because to me, because of the, the conductivity, indium is like 78, something somewhere like that. Yeah. Um, it seemed like it's more like a barrier than a conductor. Yeah. Yeah. That. But that. So that was my question. Like, am I just measuring wrong after the deleting because we are using shear force, right? Right. To put off the IHS, and this can also change material thickness slightly. Um, that sounds too thick. Sounds too thick. But I, I mean, I'd have to pull up some drawings, but I can't do that on camera. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Oh, um, good. That sounds too thick. I. Because usually the indium flows a little bit during the process, so yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'll have to check for that. Can you can you tell us a bit about the the manufacturing of um, the the solar tim? Like the silicon has to be prepared in a specific way, like so for for the yeah, because yeah, because indium doesn't stick to silicon directly, right? So yeah. are you asking like what are the steps that are done in order to get it to stick. Yeah. Um, so I can't, I can't go into the details <laughs> directly, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, there is a surface treatment that is done on the silicon, right? So when we're talking about dye thinning, that's one of the other things that we have to worry about, right? Is not only do I thin the dye and then just drop the IHS on, but now I have to thin the dye. I have to do the surface preparation. 
right, in order to get things ready for the dye attach. Um, so there are additional steps there other, after the dye thinning before you can get the, the solder tim on. But you cannot uh, on camera tell us. I can't, right? I can't talk <laughs> about makes, those on camera. Makes sense, makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Talking about dye thinning, um, I mentioned that we manually did that after we thought like 0 0.8 is too much and we grinded it down to 0 0.6. Um, obviously, doing that by hand is not as, as precise yeah. as doing it in a machine. Uh, like, what would be your personal opinion on that? Do you think like there's a, like a huge risk? Um, <laughs> <laughs> if it was me in my garage, it probably would be a risk. <laughs> um, I, well, I don't know. I, I, how are you doing the thinning? Like, what what equipment were you using? Uh, we're using uh, like um, very fine sandpaper. So there's like an orbital sander that you were like like uh, we made specific tools to to clamp the CPU PCB in it. Um, so we can have an even even pressure on okay. the die, and then very fine sandpaper like 2,000 grit. Yeah. And then just uh, move it back and forth with a little bit of water maybe. And, yeah. Uh, I mean that's not too far off from the way we do it in the fab, right? We yeah. use the chemical mechanical polishers in the fab, which are just massive sanding machines, really. So like, so I that mean, some CMPA engineer is going to be like, <laughs> it's way more complicated than that. But yeah. <laughs> but, but then so the thing is um, uh, after grinding it down after after thinning um, we are left with just bare silicon yeah. and people are mostly used li using liquid metal on this which is gallium yeah gallium that has uh, some fun indium. properties <laughs> yeah yeah um, so uh, and gallium loves to d diffuse into metals yes so uh, do you have any uh, probably not not real insight because you never used liquid metal in indium but do you do you, do you think that there's a direct risk doing that or? Not, I'm not aware of any on silicon and we've played around with it a bit on our mobile parts, mm -hmm. um, just exp experimenting in the lab. And as far as I know, there's nothing, I mean, w the experiments that we've ran have been at our normal mobile die thicknesses, which are somewhere be around, let's say 200 microns, plus or minus. A so a lot thinner. Right, so a lot yeah. thinner than what you're going. And as far as I know, we haven't seen any problems with the silicon itself. Now, there, as you're aware, right, like you don't want to get aluminum to get in contact with it. Yeah. Really yeah. bad things happen. Yeah. Um, and also uh, some of our, actually, I don't know that any of our, uh, no, some of our packages, if you've got die side capacitors mm -hmm. on the package itself, you'd want to keep it away from those, obviously. Yeah. Um, but I think from the silicon perspective, you're probably okay. Okay, because we were often wondering if there is like a, a passivation layer on uh, like if you get the, your your CPU with polymer tim, let's right. say, um, it always looked like there is still an additional um, coating on on top of it, or was it just because it looked looks Polish? Or um, I don't think we put a passivation layer on the backside. We might, but I'm not sure. Because I was always people that often people on the internet speculate about passivation layer on top when polymer tin was used, and that if you thin it, you get rid of this layer, and then you expose the CPU to additional risk with liquid metal. But from my perspective, it never made sense to have some like if it's the bare silicon, why would you have a passivation layer on top for polymer tin? Yeah, it didn't make sense to me. I don't think there's anything on that surface. Okay, but I don't. Again, don't quote me on that, right? Yeah, you know I mean? I guess, yeah, some, I somebody comes back and says, hey, here's an SEM <laughs> of, of what the material there, and it's not pure silicon. You're like, oh, Mark was wrong. Yeah. Um, but, but I don't think there's a passivation layer on the back. Okay, so I mean, th that's already a great insight, especially for, for the liquid metal community. Um, because also for me, you know, with uh, Thermal Grizzly side, we are a liquid metal uh, yeah. producer. We manufacture that stuff, and then it's always like, uh, how do we estimate the risk for our customers using it on a chip? But if you say there is no direct risk of diffusion after um, like lapping, that it, uh, it would go into the I chip. Don't, I don't think there is for it going into the chip. The parts where you'd want to be careful about it is if it gets down onto the substrate itself. I'm not sure what would happen there. Mm -hmm. um, like w this is some of the th some of the things that we've been wondering about, and like we'd like to start studying it, but we don't have a whole lot in there, right? In terms of what happens if the liquid metal sits on the solder mask that sits on top of the substrate, right? Like, is that no. gonna cause problems long term? I mean, from our experience from like, let's say 4,700K and above, nothing ever happened. All right, so. So even after a long time, yeah. just, just talking about the CPUs, we did not see any 
uh, change to the surface on there? Yeah, so like the things that, the areas that to look out for would be, there is a epoxy fillet that sits around here on the edge of the, of the die, right? I don't know what that would do if it stays in contact with the liquid metal. If you've been doing it since the fourth generation, then Nothing ever happened. nothing's yeah. ever happened, then yeah. you're probably good there. Yeah. Um, and then obviously you don't want to get it into the die attach area. Um, so, yeah, I think as, in terms of the silicon itself, I'm not aware of anything, and I can check afterwards. I can ask the team that's been looking into it more um, if there's anything they're aware of and send you a note. So. Yeah, so that was a, a, quick, a quick discussion with Mark regarding um, die thinning, especially for people wondering, like, why is Intel not going for the like, thinnest die possible? Um, Conclusion, I would say, is that it depends on the specific CPU, what kind of yep. uh, uh, like architecture it's using, how the die layout is, um, like, like you, how you lay yeah, out the, the die, die. The die floor plan, yep. Yeah, and uh, then you always try to keep it as thin as possible, but at the same time, you also have to think about manufacturing, right? Yeah. So sometimes, even if you would love, to, like, for like as an engineer, you would love to have it thinner, but it doesn't always work out. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? There's the mathematical <laughs> optimum, and then there's the practical optimum of what can yeah. we actually build in the time frame we need to be building the parts. So those two are always at tension. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, Mike, thank you very much. You're welcome. It was a nice chat, and um, thanks for joining in. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.